presenter today will be Ron Heffern. Mr. Heffern has more than 40 years of experience in the planning, design, development, and optimization of marine energy and transportation facilities. He's a global leader and innovator in the field of floating LNG import and export terminal marine infrastructure design, and led a team to pioneer the definition of 60 unique configurations and 20 alternative mooring solutions for permanently moored LNG vessels to lower CAPEX, lower OPEX, and improve birth uptime. And with that, I will hand off today's presentation to Ron. Okay, thanks, Teresa. I will share my screen and we'll get rolling. Okay. So, Thank you all for attending. I really do encourage your uh, questions at the end of this uh, brief presentation, and I would love to make this a dialogue. I, uh, hang on just a sec, I'll get this rolling. Okay, so our agenda today will, um, will include a discussion of why is the document needed? Who's our target audience? What's the applicability and the scope of the document? I'll talk about the working group team, the, uh, give an overview of the contents, and then uh, talk about what's next. Uh, regarding the working group team, we have a pretty large contingent of um, US representatives that um, participated in this document. This was definitely a big team effort. Almost all of them are here with us today, and I'll, I'll talk about who is here and um, what topics they were involved with. So they will join me in answering any questions that might come up at the end. So starting with why is the document needed? The story really started with the MOTEMS document, which was uh, a California initiative. California, the MOTEMS document is, stands for Marine Oil Terminal Engineering and Maintenance Standards. This started back in the 90s. Uh, and it started because the average age of oil terminals in California is now more than 60 years. They were mostly designed before they were serious seismic standards, so there were some vulnerabilities. Many of them were quite old, um, even 90, 100 years old, uh, and there was no standard existing for upgrading these existing terminals. So after uh, this process of creating MOTEMS, which was, uh, grandfathered by uh, Professor Martin Muskegon from the State Lands Commission, they were ultimately adopted as part of the California Building Code. Um, the, the process involves a rather onerous periodic audit process uh, to comply with these standards. So there was um, um, a process then that occurred in the industry whereby uh, other jurisdictions started to wake up to this California process. Uh, and rather than, uh, than all of the uh, states and Coast Guard or other entities picking up and developing their own standards, the uh, industry discussed and decided that this would be better served by doing a document written by the industry for the industry. And that was the genesis of the MOTEMS document. So why did the terminal owners and operators embrace the PN guidance? Uh, it was when we started this working group, the first question we asked of all of our uh, industry partners was, is this a good idea? Should we be doing this? And the universal answer of, amongst those on the committee was we, we definitely should, because there was a need for uniform standards amongst the industry. So the oil majors, for example, routinely lease third party terminals, and they don't like to give out their own standards uh, for marine terminals. They really wanted an independent uh, document that was uh, written by the industry uh, to fill this important gap. I'll also emphasize that OCIMF, the Oil Companies International Marine Forum, was very involved in the process. They had a representative that served on our committee. They also served as our blue ribbon panel. So they, uh, we gave them the document when it was uh, just prior to publication. They reviewed it in very detail amongst their membership. Um, it ended up being a very collaborative process that uh, was the genesis of forming a sister relationship between OCIMF and PIANC that um, we started a couple years ago. 
So the evolution of the document is um, <clears throat> we first published PNC, uh, report 153 and the focus of the document was oil and petrochemical terminals, but we excluded LNG because we had enough on our plate just trying to write the document for oil and petrochem. Once we were complete, we were asked to update the document uh, by adding LNG, floating LNG, single point moorings, multi-point moorings, addressing any uh, comments that we received on the original document. So that's what we recently published in October, 2022. And that's the focus of this uh, webinar. For the future, and I'll talk a little bit more about this uh, at the end of this uh, webinar, we've been asked to um, add green fuels terminals to this mix. So um, you'll hear a little bit more about that in a few minutes. So who's our target audience? The, it's fairly simple. We're, we're targeting designers of new terminals. Engineers charged with inspecting, rehabilitating, and upgrading existing terminals, owners and operators of terminals, lessors and lessees of 30 third party terminals, and also marine terminal equipment manufacturers. So that, that's really who we're targeting this document to be. It's not meant for um, for lay people or people who don't have a background in this in owning and operating these terminals. The applicability and scope. So the guidance is applicable to existing and new marine oil, gas, and petrochem terminals, as you would guess from the title. It's also uh, specifically focused on the following, at shore and near shore terminals, sea island terminals, single point moorings and multi-point moorings, and subsea pipelines. So as long as it's connected to the shore with either a trestle or a pipeline or some other fixed link, then it's within the scope. So it's limited to uh, the marine infrastructure and the ship shore interface, and it's not including the backland uh, issues like tank farms and shoreside pipelines. It includes oil terminals, petrochem terminals, LNG, LPG, uh, floating LNG terminals, and there's a lot of different acronyms you can see there that apply compressed natural gas terminals, and it's generally applicable in its current form to green fuel terminals and liquefied CO2 terminals. Uh, green fuels meaning hydrogen, ammonia, methanol, but it's not specifically addressing those, um, any uh, complications or challenges of those terminals. Those will be addressed in the upcoming new update of the document. But when it comes to navigation issues, structural design, that sort of thing, it's generally applicable to all of these uh, products. So let's talk about the working group team. We have, this was a very large group because it's quite a large document. Uh, we have 34 members representing 11 countries, as you can see here. And we have um, a nice diverse uh, perspectives and discipline representation. So our perspectives come from energy companies, uh, particularly the oil and gas uh, industry, consulting engineers, former regulators, equipment manufacturers, and academia. Our disciplines were quite quite a bit more broad than a typical PANC document. Uh, it includes, of course, the civil structural, coastal and ocean, but also shipping, geotechnical, uh, electrical and instrumentation, mechanical and piping, fire protection, risk management, and compliance. This shows the uh, members of the U.S. Um, team that was involved with the project. So, as I mentioned, there's 34 total. We have quite a representative from the U.S. Um, so, Take a look at this list. If there are any specific questions you'd like to ask of any of these uh, folks on the topics that they covered, uh, we can do that at the end of this uh, webinar. And then the contents overview. We start, the, the document really is divided into two parts. The first part is the design of new and upgrade of existing terminals. So I'm gonna cover uh, a slide on each of these topics, so I won't read this whole list. Part two is the inspection and assessment of existing terminals. 
So again, I'll cover each of these uh, topics with a slide. Jumping into chapters one and two were just the uh, introduction and the working group members. And um, so I'm gonna jump to uh, chapter three, uh, the functional requirements, basis of design and design phases. So we start with uh, defining the concept of operations. What's the objective of the facility? What are the uh, basic operational requirements of the facility? That then leads to functional requirements, uh, throughput, storage capacity, that what is the mix of products handled, the number of bursts that are needed, the anticipated occupancy. That flows into the detailed basis of design. We cover quite a bit uh, in this update, the uh, configuration alternatives. And what I mean by that <clears throat> is the, um, they're fairly standard for oil and petrochemical terminals because typically these vessels come in, they either load or unload, and then they leave. So it's a transient mooring. But when we introduce uh, LNG uh, into the mix, particularly um, floating LNG terminals, then we involve what we call permanently moored vessels. So there's three categories. You can have transient mooring, you can have semi-permanent mooring, meaning that vessel will stay there until some major event is uh, approaching, for example, a cyclone. Um, it's often uh, defined by a named storm for insurance terms, uh, for insurance purposes. The third is permanently moored, and that means it has to survive um, all forecast conditions for the, its lifetime of service. So then it goes on to define the site characteristics, um, which is really focused on what do we need to collect, not how to do it. Uh, dealing with the survey and geotechnical issues, the met ocean and ambient environmental data, uh, environmental and social site and neighboring facilities, available uh, support services and resources. Then we finally get to the basis of design. Um, you can see all the issues listed here. It's design life and the vessel characteristics, the applicable codes, um, basic terminal dimensions, proximity, loading equipment, and construction phasing. Now, if we move to uh, chapter four, this deals with risk, uh, safety, and security management. Um, and you can see on the bottom right, this uh, asterisk notes that this is where we made significant changes from the previous document, particularly around uh, uh, petrochemical terminals and LNG terminals. So it's got uh, pretty strong guidance in, uh, in this area. So we talk about the safety philosophy and the risk criteria, the risk control strategy, risk assessment in relationship to, uh, to project development, the HAZ ID process and the HAZ op, um, safety studies. We put a lot of effort into the safety and design area, controlled uh, zone concepts, and then security risk management. Then we get to chapter five, which is probably the longest chapter in this document, and it's pretty long. The whole document is uh, around 350 pages, which is kind of a monster for, uh, for Piank. But we put a lot of effort into this. It has a lot of changes from the original 153 document. It deals with siting considerations going into the details of uh, site conditions. Then we put a lot of um, thought into concept and configuration selection because in the uh, LNG world, there's a lot of different ways you can configure the vessels and more of the vessels. Um, so that's a, a pretty significant change. It covers general layout, operational considerations, jetty type terminal design considerations, single point mooring and multi-point mooring terminals. Alternative mooring systems, because there are a lot of emerging uh, solutions that we didn't want to ignore, and then interface management. Chapter six goes into um, all of the structural design codes, the loads, and very importantly, the load combinations. So this also has a lot of uh, significant updates from the previous version. So we talk about mooring types, design codes, loads, load combinations. Then chapter seven is uh, the mooring and berthing. So we, again, this is uh, quite, a, quite a bit of change from the 153. Um, 
We talk about the philosophy of design, the description of the function behind the mooring system components. Then there's a lot of uh, evaluation of the methodology and the analytical tools, boundary conditions and such. We provide guidance for load determination on all of the uh, loads you can see here. And we retain the uh, guidance for mooring components that was in the 153, that uh, F sub Z A equation that uh, we put in uh, in the 153 document. Chapter eight covers structural materials and constructability considerations. So uh, there are a few peculiarities, for example, uh, with LNG, these are just examples, but low temperature splash protection uh, for cryogenic um, uh, spill, uh, steel for low temperature service. There's also concrete issues, constructability considerations, environmental and sustainable sustainability considerations. Chapter nine is geotechnical design. Uh, so there's discussion on the risk registry and the risk management plan, guidance for scoping the uh, geophysical and geotechnical site investigations, and then for, um, for site specific design criteria, including static loading, dynamic loading, dredge material management, settlement, seismic loading. So quite a lot of uh, really good uh, guidance there. Seismic design, um, Starts with the design philosophy, um, has a discussion of the difference between uh, um, what the uh, marine oil and petrochemical terminals require versus conventional building codes, because there is quite a bit of difference there. Performance levels, uh, earthquake hazards, the classification of structures, acceptable levels of damage, the definition of damage levels, uh, seismic analysis methods, Topside systems, uh, seismic uh, detailing, and then evolving issues like um, uh, how do you handle scenarios of multiple earthquakes and aftershocks, the combination of mooring and earthquake loading, combination of inertial and kinematic loading. Piping and pipelines, not surprisingly, starts with philosophy discussion. That was something we've uh, tried to incorporate into each of the chapters. Um, general design considerations, materials, there's pressure relief and containment, sumps, pipe stress analysis, the valving uh, pipe supports, subsea pipelines are definitely part of this scope and uh, low temperature hoses, piping and equipment, often associated with uh, cryogenic transfers of LNG and LPG. Mechanical equipment is typically covering things like the, uh, the marine loading arms, the gangways, uh, cranes, winches, vapor control, uh, transfer pumps, surge tanks, flares, boil off gas compressors. So a lot of good stuff there. Uh, electrical systems, instrumentation and controls. Again, this um, has quite a lot of updates from the, uh, from the previous version particularly for systems and instrumentation. So it covers design and equipment selection and the, uh, the design philosophy, has a hazard area classification and equipment marking. So the uh, chapter 14 is covering fire protection and emergency evacuation. So there's guidance on uh, standards to be used here, the types of fires and the typical extinguishing materials, uh, fire prevention, prevention and isolation, materials, spacing and ignition sources, uh, focus on isolation issues, uh, alarm and signaling systems, fire detection, uh, fire suppression, and very importantly is emergency egress. You see a lot of terminals around the world that have only one means of egress from the terminal. And this standard, as well as others, requires that there be a secondary egress provided at terminals. Then we move to part two. I'm going to read every word on this slide, so this will take about 45 minutes. Okay, just kidding. Um, this is just provided at the front of this section to provide uh, a, a flow diagram for how the following chapters are intended to work together. So there's four chapters in part two, records and baseline inspection, 
there's a reassessment of existing facilities, there's periodic inspections, and then there's post event inspections. So the, I won't go into any of this detail, um, but just know that these are, are there and, uh, and quite useful. So starts with records, baseline inspection and assessment. So there's um, really strong guidance here for record keeping because it's been a problem in the past at uh, marine oil terminals where you don't have strong records of what was built. <clears throat> so there's uh, you know specific guidance on how to keep records on the layout drawings, the structural uh, record drawings uh, as built in particular, berth operational parameters and limits, water depth, fender system details, mooring points, mechanical electrical systems, and fire protection. Then there's guidance on baseline inspection and structural appraisal. Baseline inspections are typically done um, in, under two circumstances. They, uh, they can be done when you have never inspected a facility in the, in the past. So you're now doing a rather thorough investigation to document what's there, because often you don't have decent drawings. So it takes a little extra effort. Actually, it takes a lot of extra effort to document what's there if you don't have drawings to go by when you're doing your baseline inspection. And then there's a, um, a secondary purpose is if once you've finished building a new facility, you conduct your baseline uh, inspection to document and make sure it was built in accordance with the uh, with the drawings. The reassessment re re of existing facilities um, has quite a number of uh, really useful guidance on triggers for assessment. So why would you reassess your existing facilities? What changes have occurred that might trigger this? And who's responsible for doing this? So functional changes are um, typical in this area that could involve a uh, larger vessel that could have bigger sail area or a deeper draft. Could be a change in water depth and uh, resulting uh, allowable vessel draft so you can bring in deeper vessels or it might be allowing deeper dra deeper draft vessels to pass your facility and they're therefore putting up passing vessel loads that were larger than uh, originally contemplated. Um, equipment upgrades for code compliance could be an increase of loads due to uh, dual purpose uh, use or new equipment that's added or it might be external factors, uh, as I just mentioned, like a new larger vessel passing the terminal. Another type of trigger could be issues arising through vetting or uh, from the purchase or lease of the terminal. Another group of, um, of trigger issues are significant deterioration. That's typically from uh, things that occur over time, uh, corrosion, uh, obviously, or it might be scour. Extraordinary events are things like uh, the terminal may have gotten uh, a hard berthing or it might have been hit by debris or a flood or a fire or other extraordinary events that uh, require you to do a comprehensive reassessment. Seismic is another big driver. Um, and then, oops, go back. Um, water level or bottom uh, channel bottom changes also drive this and then regulatory compliance. There might be new regulations that kicked in. As, uh, as in the case of California. Periodic inspections um, start with choosing an inspection philosophy, and we present two different philosophies here that um, you have to decide which one you want to follow. Time-based systems are the ones most of us are uh, familiar with. So you conduct a um, Inspection above water and underwater on a routine frequency. It might be five years for an underwater inspection, for example, or it might be based on uh, uh, how long, how the uh, condition of the facility at the time of the previous inspection will drive the future inspection uh, frequency. Whereas risk based inspection philosophies are really looking at the consequences um, as well as the susceptibility of uh, the particular. Uh, structural or equipment system that you're looking at. So both of these are very valid. It's often the case that um, large asset owners that are trying to optimize their expenditure on uh, inspection and and uh, and be a little bit more proactive will choose the risk-based approach. 
it often requires that you have somebody really dedicated to uh, to running uh, a risk based uh, approach to inspections. Uh, and when, if you want to take a simpler approach and you have fewer assets to handle, it's more common to use a time based approach. So this chapter covers the limits of inspection, the structural boundaries, the components and systems, and it provides guidance on how frequently should you inspect, what are the team qualifications, what's the scope of the inspection effort, gives guidance on how to evaluate the rate so that they become more uniform amongst different uh, teams, follow-up activities, documentation, and reporting. The last chapter of the document is post-event inspections. So this is different from a periodic inspection because what you're trying to concentrate on here is the damage that might have been done as a result of an incident, not damage that occurs over time, such as corrosion. So it's a different focus. So you wanna, uh, you're really trying to determine whether the uh, facility is still fit for purpose or whether perhaps a reassessment is required uh, in order you can be, before you can put it back in service. So accidental or environmental events could include vessel impact, which is probably the most common, uh, earthquakes, cyclones, fire or explosion, flooding, tsunamis or other high wave events. Uh, there's also additional guidance provided on the qualifications of the team, the scope and the, and the focus of the inspection effort, uh, the rating systems and follow-up activities. So that is the, the gist of the document. What I wanna talk about next is where do we go from here? So as I mentioned, we're gonna be updating the document to include green fuels. And um, just uh, about a week and a half ago the at the Pienk, um, meetings in the headquarters in Brussels, um, XCOM approved our terms of reference for what we're calling now 153C. So I will uh, remain the uh, chairman of the group as long as people want me to. <laughs> um, and uh, we'll, we're starting to form the group right now. So we are given the mandate to do this as quickly as possible because there's a lot of terminals, um, many of you are likely aware of how hot the hydrogen and ammonia and methanol markets are, and there's terminals being designed, planned and designed right now all over the world that could really use this document, this guidance. So things that will be addressed in the new document are uh, the unique uh, challenges of handling these different green fuels. As an example, um, LCO2, liquefied uh, uh, CO2 has an issue uh, during transfers of uh, the potential for uh, icing up in the loading arms and blocking the transfer under uh, phase shift, shift conditions. So we wanna provide some ways to deal with that. And I, I think you could say that for virtually every type of uh, green fuels terminals. So this will be um, a really interesting uh, endeavor. I'm looking forward to it. And we're looking for new members that would be interested to serve in this area. And in particular, we're looking for individuals with process experience and those with um, that understand the challenges of green fuels terminals uh, so that we can ensure that we're provide, providing comprehensive uh, guidance. If you haven't ordered this uh, document yet, you can go to the Pianc website. It's of course free for uh, uh, companies that are uh, Pianc members. It's 295 euros for um, those who are not, but you can go, uh, you can take this link or you can just search for it uh, in Google to find this. There we have it. So I think um, now, Teresa, if you don't mind, we could open it up to any questions that people might have. Absolutely. Thanks, John. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen to kick us off into the Q&A session. And uh, in fact, we have already received a few questions. So the first question I'm going to ask you uh, is report 153 superseded by 153B. And I'll add on to that. Would you expect 
C to supersede 153B when it's released? Yep, that's a good question, and I should have addressed that. It's an easy question. Yes, the newest version of the document replaces the earlier ones. Okay, makes a lot of sense. Our next question here, does this document cover FPSOs in offshore deep water with no pipeline connection to shore? It does not. Um, the critical condition to be applicable under this guide is you have to have, um, it can be in whatever water depth you want, but it has to have a connection to shore. Typically, when it has a connection to shore, you're in as shallow a water as you, as you can. Uh, so it'll cover uh, floating LNG units, um, floating FSRUs, for example, which are a type of FPSO in the grand scheme of things. But there's always a connection, whether it's a subsea pipeline connecting it to shore or a, um, a trestle coming back to the shore. Okay. And I will take this moment just to hit pause. Uh, there are a few folks submitting questions, but I would encourage anyone on the call, if you have a question you would like to ask Ron or another of the U.S. Working Group members that's on the call today, uh, feel free to type it into the chat panel and we will get to them as they are received. The next question we have received here uh, starts with, thank you for such a nice introduction to the Pink Code. Where can we propose collaboration with the Working Group? Okay, so the best way, um, there will be each national section of PIANC will do a call for members. So if you're, um, if your company or you are an individual member of PIANC, you'll be receiving an email uh, asking for um, uh, if you're interested in participating. Uh, if you're not and, you're, and you might be excluded from, from those emails, just reach out to me uh, and I'm happy to, um, to make sure that you're considered um, for the uh, for the working group, and I, again, I'll just emphasize that we're particularly interested. We we have a lot of marine terminal experts on the group. What we really need is um, people who have experience handling process engineering issues and piping issues and that sort of thing associated with green fuels. Okay. My email was included uh, earlier. I think um, just make sure we give that to everybody. We will we'll include that in the close out email for anyone interested to reach out to you. Okay. Our next question here is, are you planning on updating the mooring and birthing chapters based on the detailed work performed in Pank Working Group 211 and 231? So, yes, we are. Um, that document is, um, under um, review right now before it's published. There's a, some interesting uh, challenges we're facing trying to finish that document. I serve on the Markham um, uh, Commission. Uh, so we're working through those issues now. But yes, that will, um, it's a good question. And yes, that will be considered and incorporated uh, as appropriate into the new document. Any, um, I don't know if we have um, any of our other members that would like to add to that answer. Uh, that might be participating, any of our U.S. working group members? Uh, Just Ron, Ron, this is Martin. You might want to add that the uh, new Pearson Wharves uh, standard that's being developed will have an entire chapter on mooring and birthing, and that's, that's under development right now. Which document are you referring to, Martin? Um, the one chaired by um, Omar on uh, the stand U.S. ASE standard for Pearson Wharves. Yep, the ASCE document. Okay. Okay. We have two related questions here, so I'll pose them both to you and you can answer them as you'd like. Does the inspection and assessment part of the document refer to industry standards such as ASCE Manual of Practice 130? And we got another question relating to that manual. There must be quite a lot of overlap with ASCE 6119, MOF 130, and other recent guidelines. How is this standard different? So let me take the, um, the first one first, which was dealing with manual 130, which is an ASCE document on the uh, inspection and assessment of waterfront facilities. Um, 
there is uh, quite a bit of overlap between them, but I can assure you they're consistent because I wrote both parts of it. I, I wrote the 130 as well as the PANC part uh, on inspections. So they're consistent, but we didn't want to refer to only a US document in an international guidance document like this so that we broadened it. And then we also included the time-based uh, methodology into that. So uh, it's a good question. On the uh, ASC 61, um, maybe Martin, if you want to address that question. Yeah, yeah sure, Ron. Um, 6114, uh, chaired by Gail Johnson, who also wrote the seismic chapter of this document. Um, they're just about ready to release a new update, which will be very, um, very interesting and it, it updates a lot of the information on the um, the types of earthquakes, whether it's uh, um, operational or terminate or life safety. And that'll be, I think, published maybe late this year or early next year. And it'll be a 61 uh, 2023 document. And we'll use that document to update you know, 153C accordingly. Understood. Our next question here, I would be interested in my comments with respect to how 153B is predicted to interact with more in class standards, such as CNV, POS, MOOR, pause more. Pause more, yeah. So there, um, we were informed by these uh, class society documents as we wrote our guidance. So um, particularly the DNV document, uh, which was um, published at the time of uh, creating this document. So we're aware of, of what they are. We're consistent with those documents. We, uh, we think there's no conflict, but uh, this is an opportunity also, and I'll emphasize this point. If anybody has comments on 153B and would like us like to find ways to improve it, we are all ears because we've got this great opportunity to incorporate uh, any changes into 153C. Understood. And as you said earlier, they can do that by reaching out to you using your email address that will be included in our closeout email later today. Okay. Uh, our next question, does this document address the design of mooring systems and mooring points or structures? with particular reference to permanently moored vessels, such as FSRUs? In particular, what about overlap with MEG-4? So, yes, it does. And it goes beyond MEG-4 because MEG-4 specifically does not address permanently moored vessels, uh, which is an important note to make. So, yes, we're providing guidance. We refer to, um, you know, the Fender Design Manual, for example, from PIANC as much as we can. Um, but we are also providing quite a bit of additional guidance beyond that document uh, for the, in the case of permanently moored vessels. Um, again, I'll pause and just see if any of our other members uh, from the US team would like to add to that. Uh, yeah, Ron, I'll, I'll add that um, the, the, the return period for the load, load combinations is very important uh, when you have permanently moored and we've looked at the US Navy and other references to figure out how to address that. And in, in the chapter on loads and load combinations, you choose either a European approach or an American approach. Once mm -hmm. you've selected one of those, you don't change. You have to stay with it because of all the factors involved and the complications. And um, you try to give direction for both of those regarding loads and load combinations. Yeah, very good point. Our next question here, does the report contain any discussion on security of sites from water or land confrontation? There is only general guidance in the sense of uh, virtually every country that we're dealing with um, in these terminals is a signatory to the IMO. And there are protocols in place for how to do a, a port facility security assessment that results in a port facility security plan that in, gets incorporated into design uh, requirements for a terminal. So we don't go beyond that except, uh, you know, highlighting the fact that you need to do that and you need to uh, address the, uh, the nature of the threats, uh, it's typically not so much from the land side as it is from the water side is what we're dealing with. But um, 
that that's about as far as we can go because we can't get into specific uh everything is a very site specific or project specific requirement when it comes to security mm -hmm. okay thank you for that answer and our next question touches on a topic you you covered early on in a little bit more detail what if any relationship does this guidance have with california's modems will modems reference this document so i can't speak for the california state lands commission but what we've seen from the past is that um, when we published 153, the original document, they um, they learned from it or took um, new guidance from it and tried to incorporate that into uh, updates to MOTEMS. Now, I don't know if anybody from State Lands Commission is on the line that would like to chime in. You're welcome to do so. And if there's not, I know that Martin is now consulting back to them um, and maybe he can address that, but maybe Martin, do you know if anybody else from state lands is on the line? I don't think so. Um, and MOTEMS came out with a addition in 2022, very similar to 19. And um, it has priority over any other document because it is part of the California building code chapter 31 F. So um, yes, they, they're aware of it. Yes, they're, they know about it and um, I worked for them for 27 years and know that there's a lot of overlap as Ron is very much aware because Ron was the original contractor as we developed MOTEM. So yes, everybody's aware of it and um, they know what they have to uh, use in design and analysis. Okay. Okay, thanks for that answer. And another question here about other guidance that's out there. How much overlap will there be in this report with the PIANC Working Group 211 report that will be released this year on the design of fender systems? Are there any specific recommendations or different considerations for fender design included in this report? Yeah, I think this was similar to the answer I tried to provide earlier, and maybe I wasn't clear enough, but that 211 report on, uh, it's the update uh, of the fender design manual, um, is being finalized now. It's uh, we just had a lot of discussion on it in our Brussels meeting a couple of weeks ago. Um, there's some issues that are uh, uh, being discussed and maybe some challenges put out there to uh, do a little bit more homework before we put it out to the, uh, uh, for publishing. But whatever the result of that is, we will be looking at and incorporating into the 153C document as we go forward. Okay, thanks for going into a little bit more detail there. And our next question also starts with a thank you for your presentation. Uh, following it up with, did you work on EIA or oil spill modeling? No, that's not really part of the um, guidance that we provide in the document where we're staying away from permitting issues and, uh, and spill modeling and that sort of thing. Sorry about that. This is more focused on design. <laughs> Understood. It would be Thanks twice as thick, I think, if we tried to address all the environmental issues. I can imagine. Regarding existing terminals, is this document introducing new and more cost-effective design methods, alternative to the hierarchy of resistances approach on mooring systems? Trick question. Um, Martin, anything you want to chime in on that one? Can you read that question again? I want to make sure I understood it. Absolutely. So this is regarding existing terminals. Is mm -hmm. this document introducing new or more cost-effective design methods alternative to the hierarchy of resistances approach on mooring systems? Martin, you want to try to take a stab at that one? Yeah, yeah, I'll take a stab. Um, obviously, over time, vessels get bigger, which means, like Ron said, larger sail areas, larger areas for, for current load. And what do you do if you have mooring hooks that are 20 or 30 years old, and now you have a bigger ship come in. Um, this document provides an equation, and Ron showed it, this F sub Z um, A, and there has to be some degree of um, risk and philosophy before you say you can use those hooks or you can't. Um, and this document provides a very conservative way to calculate those hooks and what's what's acceptable. But again, philosophy and risk need to be played into it. 
and um, it is a real problem and um, it has to be addressed. Uh, we give you I guidance. Also, Go yeah. ahead, Ron. I, I would also add that in the current um, document, the 153B, um, you know, there's a hierarchy of failure that uh, we describe in the document that you want to try to comply with so that, you know, your mooring lines fail before your bollards fail or your, or your, uh, I should say the quick release hooks. Uh, so, th so that you can replace things timely and you don't want your structure to fail. So that's the ideal scenario that you want to follow. Sometimes that's hard to do on an existing structure or you, uh, you often design your mooring system based on the size of the mooring lines that are going to be used by the vessels. But if that vessel is calling in Alaska and then bringing those same lines to a port like LA or Long Beach, that is a much more benign scenario. You don't necessarily want to design your mooring system for those larger mooring lines. So there's an out that's provided in the document that uh, simply allows you to use your engineering judgment to, in situations like that. So there's some weasel words in there to, uh, to help you out in, in circumstances that are more unusual. Okay. Thank you for that thorough answer. Um, and I believe that's all of the questions we've received so far. So right now I'm going to put in a final call for questions. If you have a question again for Ron or any other member of the uh, US portion of the working group team, feel free to drop it into the chat panel and we'll get to it in a minute. Um, Ron, for now, I'll pass the mic back to you to talk a little bit about your experience in this working group and in Jank generally. Yeah, sure. Happy to. Um, um, just as I, I'd like to just express my experience, if you will, and in, um, in my involvement in Jank and why you might want to consider um, your own involvement if you're not currently involved. So, first, just an overview of Jank. Um, there are members in 66 countries. There's over 500 corporate members now involved and 1,800 individual members, 27 national sections and 12 platinum sponsors. So this group has really grown over the years. Um, the, uh, my personal involvement is I've um, been serving as the US representative to the Maritime Commission. So as I mentioned, we just had our latest meeting a couple of weeks ago in Brussels. I've been the chairman of 153, 153B, and 153C that's coming up. I've also been a member of um, Working Group 42 on life cycle management of port structures and Working Group 30, which was a uh, uh, income document uh, on the inventory of inspection and repair techniques for navigation structures. So overall, I would say that the kind of the benefits that I have seen from my involvement in, uh, in PIANC are the first thing is this free access to a vast trove of Pianc reports. So uh, that is uh, that is quite nice because it covers there's uh, documents on a lot of topics that you can access for free. Um, I would say not uh, not less than that one is just the ability to network with global colleagues. So when you're sharing uh, your experiences and practices with the global community and you get to hear what other people are doing, it's invaluable uh, to a learning experience. So that's the third one is continuous learning and knowledge sharing. And then uh, the opportunities that this presents uh, are first serving on the working groups themselves, working uh, as, uh, on, as part of your national section. This uh, uh, webinar, for example, is sponsored by the US section, which is one of the national sections and then serving on the commissions. So lots of opportunities to be involved. I think you're muted, Teresa. You're very right, I am. <laughs> I was just saying, thanks for talking about your experience. You know, we do have some PANC members on the call, but often on these types of webinars, we get a lot of folks that are less familiar with this organization. So that's a great overview of the opportunities that it provides. Uh, when you were going through that slide, we did just get one more question, which is, will a copy of the slides be available? Ron, I'll leave that up to you, uh, whether you'd like be comfortable sharing that information or uh, whether we can just direct no to the recording. <laughs> I'll leave you to, the, okay. to distribute um, as, a, as you think, see fit, but yeah, no problem sharing them at all. Okay. 
We will circulate those again along with your contact information in our closeout emails. One will be going out today, uh, and the recording and slides will be going out at the beginning of next week. So you can look out for those then. Okay. Thank you all. Appreciate you attending. Thank you, Ron. Uh, okay. And we're just going to take a few minutes to close out the webinar with a little bit of closeout information. First and foremost, thank you, Ron, for your presentation. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today. We hope you'll also join us at upcoming Tank USA events, <clears throat> such as the Pink America 2023 conference taking place in Florida next April. It promises to be a very exciting event uh, with a lot of working group members, a lot of discussion of this type uh, that I think a lot of attendees will be interested in. As we close out today's webinar, we will be sharing two links. First, all participants are eligible to earn one PDH. Excuse me, I go back a slide. Are eligible to earn one PDH for their attendance. You can follow the link on the screen that I'll also be dropping into the chat panel here. And use the, the password that is case sensitive, all lowercase petrochemical to get your customized PDH certificate for today's webinar. Second, we greatly value your feedback. You'll find a link to a brief five question evaluation form in the chat panel. If you have a minute, we would really appreciate your input on today's event. And that does it. I wanna say thank you again for joining us to learn about PNC's updated guidelines. Uh, I hope you have a great rest of your day and we'll give you just about seven minutes back uh, before you have to head to your next meeting. Thanks so much again, Ron, for joining us and everyone okay. for your thank insightful you. questions. Bye.